1939 when it was finally consummated as the, a wish of the Methodist Church South before uniting with the Methodist Church North. And they had been divided ever since slavery uh, because of slavery. Then the South insisted that the Negroes we were then in the church be put into this separate jurisdiction geographically. It was like a map on the map. I remember when my one of my older brothers, Rossman Turpel, came home as a graduate of West Virginia State College. And he said, Papa, I've finished college now. I've got a scholarship to Howard Law School and a scholarship to Howard School of Religion. If you can justify to me why you stay in this church that doesn't want you, then I'll go to seminary. If not, I'm going to law school. And my father's words were, you don't win a battle by leaving the battlefield. They said, if we ever get this church to live up to its own pronouncements, then we can get the church straight. And if we ever get the Methodist church straight, we will have the country straight. Because there are more representatives in Congress, there are more elected officials throughout the country who are Methodists. And he said to my brother, well, you do whatever you want to do. Because my brother said, but Papa, you can be Christian without being Methodist. You can be Methodist without being this Methodist. You got AME, CME, AME Zion. And Papa said, well, they left, but we're staying. And we're staying to try to this, get this church straight. Because they can't be the Church of Jesus Christ without us. Looking at the history of the United Methodist Church and African Americans within the United Methodist Church, we find huge groups of Black people who joined the Methodist movement from its very start, who found their spiritual home in the Methodist Episcopal Church, who have remained a part of this body throughout its social metamorphosis, its changing structure, and its checkered history. It is these brave souls who have defended their presence and prodded for the church for reform, renewal, and change. It is they who have fought for justice and, and inclusiveness and who have insisted that they have as much claim on the United Methodist Church as any other United Methodist. It is these brave souls that have stayed on through the compromises on slavery, structural separation, and the committees to end segregation and even discriminatory hiring practices within the church. They have pushed for and prodded the church for renewal and change. They have been at the center and they have been the leaders for programs that will bring correction to witness and to service. They have persisted and they have witnessed change. One individual who witnessed such change was the Reverend Leotine T.C. Kelly. Reverend Kelly indicated that it took many years of difficult work to abolish the central jurisdiction and that it was a far more complicated process than anyone could have imagined. But in 1984, the Reverend Leotine Kelly was elected the first African-American female bishop in the United Methodist Church. In 1988, the Reverend Gilbert H. Caldwell wrote about the essentials for an inclusive United Methodist Church. Reverend Caldwell said, it will take courage, confession, and creativity to create a church in which racism no longer cripples and divides. About confession, the Reverend Caldwell notes, Bishops from the American Methodist Episcopal Church, the United Methodist Church, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, and the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church have met six times in consultations to work on issues of unity and cooperation. During their sixth consultation in April 1995, the bishops met in regional groups and addressed the following questions.